beginning. There we, there go. we go. Um, okay. So as we've been going, uh, there's a reason we've been doing our various lessons in the order we have. Um, we could have started with the Trinity or we could have started with Jesus. Um, but we started with Jesus because that's where the church started. The church started with all these debates and controversies, trying to wrap our heads around who was Jesus. And as soon as we started to figure out who Jesus was, then there was questions for us about who was God if we were going to confess this idea of one God, three persons, Trinity thing. Um, and so then that led to some more. But both of those conversations then led to other parts of doctrine and dogma and teachings of the church, almost the very next of which was to talk about Mary. So at the first Council of Ephesus in, what, 380, when we had yet more conversations around who was Jesus and what was the Trinity, and we added a little bit more um, to all of the creeds that we had, we had conversations around um, Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, the one who says yes to Gabriel. Um, in Hebrew, actually, uh, Miriam potentially having trans, um, having sort of morphed into Miriam by that point. But generally speaking, Miriam, uh, if you think like the prophet Miriam from Exodus, same name or at least same derivative name, because if you remember, um, or potentially uh, if you didn't know, Hebrew is based around consonants and the vowels are kind of made up. Um, and so Miriam, Miriam, they all have the same root, uh, which is uh, their rebellion, right? The, the plural third person re uh, possessive of rebellion. Um, and it makes sense when we think about the prophet Miriam and her tambourine on the safe side of the sea. And arguably it makes a lot of sense when you read things like the Magnificat, but we will get into that more. But the big conversation around Mary was who was this woman, right? So we have relatively little about her considering she was um, the mother of Jesus. Uh, you know, if we think about sort of the sons of gods that were going around at the time, if we think about the mothers of any of the Roman emperors of the time, if we think of sort of equal figures in this period of history that was Jesus' life, we have whole lot of biographies being written about women, mostly made up, but still we, we tell these whole stories of, um, about them and we get relatively little about Mary and we get even less from her own lips, right? Mary is by far um, uh, one of the more uh, vocal women in the New Testament. She is not the most vocal uh, when it comes to conversations with Jesus. Uh, Mary actually says less to Jesus than the woman at the well does. Um, but she does say a lot, right? She has a whole song dedicated to her and she certainly has uh, a lot of words put uh, in her mouth. Um, but we don't have a lot, right? We don't know where she comes from. We don't know the names of her family. We know a little bit from Luke, right? If we think about sort of the Advent and Christmas stories we tell about Mary, we know that she was from the line of David as was Joseph. We know that she had a kinswoman named Elizabeth who is from the family of Aaron, as is her husband, uh, Zechariah. We know that uh, she lived in Nazareth. She was a young woman from Nazareth. We don't technically know the status of her virginity because in Greek, the word for young woman and virgin are the same thing which has its own problems with assumptions around sexuality. Um, but we've come to believe that because it fulfills uh, ancient prophecies and sort of is on par with other stories in other religions of the time. Uh, but, you know, we don't even know that much about her. We know that she lived in, in a town called Nazareth. We know she was visited by a messenger of God named Gabriel. Um, 
and then kind of heads out to the hill country to take a vacation for the first few months of her pregnancy before coming back and telling Joseph what's up. Uh, Joseph wants to have nothing more to do with her, but is told by an angel to continue to uh, move forward with his plans to marry Mary. Um, because the one she carries is the son of God, uh, they travel to Bethlehem, not on a donkey. That's not so much in the text, but they travel to Bethlehem, where in the place where animals are housed, whether that's the first floor of a home or a stable, uh, she gives birth to Jesus, names him Jesus. In Luke, she names him Jesus. Um, in Matthew, Joseph names him Jesus. But I, she gives birth to Jesus. They very quickly thereafter uh, get a visit from three guys that bring very impractical gifts. And then they head to Egypt for several years. We don't know quite how many before coming back where she really takes over rearing this strange boy that spends more time at the temple in the synagogue than he does at home doing his homework. And then she appears a few more times after Jesus' childhood, mostly to poke and prod at Jesus, right? We know there's a few points where she's around in the crowd, um, but it's not always great. In John, Mary is the one. Mary is the reason in the Gospel of John that Jesus performs his first sign. The first sign in John is water into wine. And it happens because Mary, who was friends with the bride's mother, comes over and says, Jesus, they ran out of wine. And Jesus is like, it's not up to me. And she's like, Jesus, I said they're out of wine. And he said, yes, mother, and went and changed water into wine. And it was the best wine. So it's because of Mary that Jesus performs his first sign in the Gospel of John. But then we get other parts of the Gospel where Mary comes almost ashamed of Jesus in the synagogue, right? Who are these people, Jesus says, that want me to sort of quiet myself, right? Uh, it says his mother and his brothers came to silence him. Uh, and he says, who are my mother? Who are my brothers? Are not all these here, my mothers and brothers? And sort of walks through the crowd before they try to run him out of town. Um, and we know that she stands at the foot of the cross. Why? Because Jesus, uh, puts her into the care of the beloved disciple. And there's lots of conversations we could have about who is the beloved disciple, but we'll leave it as traditionally John. Um, and then we know that Mary was present at Pentecost. Uh, she generally hangs out with the disciples after Jesus' resurrection. Um, she's with the, well, even after the crucifixion, she, she stays with the disciples. And there's lots of tradition about what happens to Mary, but other than being present at the, uh, at, at Pentecost, at the gift of the spirit, we lose track of Mary after that. We don't know where she goes. We don't know what happens to her. We don't know what age she is when she dies. We don't know if there are other, uh, if there are other siblings of Jesus that take over care for her. We don't know anything. Uh, so that's sort of the very limited glimpse we have of Mary, mostly through the lens of how she relates to Jesus. And the problem with that is the church didn't know what to do with her. Because if we say that Jesus was fully God and fully man, then being fully God, but born of a woman, means that God, the God of all creation, right, of one essence with God the Father is Jesus, then God has a mother and a birthday. And that becomes problematic. It means that human Mary carried God in her womb for nine months and then gave birth to uh, him. In this case, it's Jesus. Um, and there's just so many problems with that for the early church because it means that there's a, there is a beginning to God, right? God has a birthday, God has a mother. Um, not to mention all of the very archaic and outdated rules around purity and things that had to do with childbirth. So it becomes problematic. But where we end up by the time of the Council of Ephesus, which is about 380 or so AD, 
is we end up with Mary and the title of Theotokos. Theotokos is, the, is Greek, Theo meaning God, Tokos meaning bearer, the one who bears, B-E-A-R-E-R, -E like wine bearer, cup bearer, gift bearer, God bearer is what we call Mary. That literally with her body, she bears God into the world. It's affirmed at the First Council of Ephesus, and in its affirmation, it, anath it anathematizes anything else. If you remember back to Nestorius, he's willing to call Mary Christotokos, the Christ bearer, but won't go so far as to say that she bears God. And what uh, the Council of Ephesus says is absolutely not. If Jesus is to be fully human and fully divine, then she must be mother of the divine. It's affirmed and reaffirmed every time debates of Jesus come up, it has to be. Uh, Mary is necessarily connected to Jesus. Um, in the 21st century, it's used particularly in the, in the Eastern Rite churches. The Western Rite churches that follow from Rome often use Blessed Virgin Mary, Our Lady of, right? The Virgin is much more where sort of the Western church focuses. But it's, it's making a comeback. Theotokos is making a comeback um, as Mary herself is making a comeback in Protestant circles. And uh, for those of us who are Lutheran, Luther likes and affirms this title for Mary. He uses this title often for her as the God bearer. Yes, John. Um, do the Catholics today use Theotokos or have, and have they used it oh, in the past? No one I was gonna say, no one has gotten rid of Theotokos. So, so Theotokos predates the Great Schism, which we'll get to at a different point, but, oh, okay. um, but, but the, the calling Mary Theotokos predates sort of the East-West split. So yes, doctrinally, everybody holds that Mary is the Theotokos. However, focus has shifted. And so Theotokos really takes hold in the Eastern church and the Western church come doesn't come up with new names but just finds so many other ways right all of yeah. most of the apparitions of mary in the you know 18th 19th 20th 21st century that we know of right all almost all of that is western right um and that's where we get much more of the our lady of lords our lady of loretto our lady of fatima our lady of guadalupe um etc right and so it's not that the western right has gotten rid of the idea of theotokos what it is to say is um, it's that and so much more. So an additional uh, title, so, so we're gonna do some titles for Mary now at this point. Some additional titles for Mary uh, is the New Eve. This was very popular with people like Irenaeus, who was one of the great church fathers, Origen, Irenaeus, these early church fathers uh, particularly Justin Martyr is one of the first ones to use this. And we get a lot from him about liturgy. And what this does is it makes the connection between uh, Mary bearing Jesus and the reversal of Eve's fall. It takes it from Romans where it, where it says by one man sin, entered, uh, sin and death entered into the world and by one man um, we were redeemed or whatever, the, the, the sort of new Adam, old Adam idea from Romans. It's problematic because it insists on Eve being the guilty one. Uh, so, so Eve is the cause of the fall and Mary by bearing Jesus fixes the problem. It's also problematic because before Mary's compared to the new Eve, Jesus is absolutely compared to the new Adam, which gets kind of weird if you follow the metaphor out too far, um, that mother and son are the same as the first, uh, at the time, believed husband and wife. It just gets weird. But there's still this idea that if by Jesus, Adam's sin is removed from the world, and we do hold to that, that's what Romans says, then Mary is the one that bears Jesus, that causes Jesus to be in the world in the same general way that Eve causes Adam to eat the, it's complicated, but it's a big one in the early church. So we can't, we can't just glance over it. 
Queen of Heaven. This is one that makes Lutherans kind of uncomfortable. Um, this is certainly not one that we hear very often in uh, 21st century usage in Lutheran churches. Um, and it's not really scriptural. So we can make, uh, we can say that the idea of bearing God in the world is scriptural, right? Jesus births Jesus, Mary births Jesus, who is God, therefore she is the God bearer. Good. If, if by Jesus, Adam's sin is removed, then as the cause of Jesus' actions in the way Eve was the cause of Adam's actions, right, we can make a connection. Queen of Heaven isn't particularly scriptural unless you read the unnamed woman who is crowned with stars uh, in Revelation 12 as Mary. Now, our Catholic siblings absolutely do read it that way. Um, I think there's some big support for that in the allegory of Revelation. But the woman who gives birth, uh, if, if, you're, if you remember when we read Revelation together, um, there's a woman in the woods, she gives birth, a dragon is out to snatch her, a, 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 a dragon is out to grab her baby. So she runs off to the place that was prepared by the angels for her. And then about a chapter later, she is the one who is crowned with 12 stars with the moon under her feet. To this day, that's a very popular depiction of Mary, right? Moon under her feet, crowned with stars. Um, but that's about as close as you can get to this title of Queen of Heaven. But it is an early one. Uh, in the church. There are many depictions, particularly through the Renaissance, of the coronation of the Virgin, right? The idea that Mary is crowned by Jesus in heaven for everything that she's done. Luther, for those of us that are uncomfortable by this, uh, because we grew up Lutheran and we didn't hear this very often, Luther actually himself uses this title at times for Mary. Um, not just in his early works when he's still working through his Catholicism, but later in his works, he still will use this title for Mary. First disciple and chief of saints. Mary is the first person in the New Testament to say yes, to do what God calls her to do. So by saying yes and agreeing to do what she's called to do, that is sort of these textbook definition of disciples. And so this is actually one that is somewhat more popular for uh, people like uh, Luther and others is they focus on the discipleship of Mary. Mary's saying yes. And this is incredibly important and one that I think depending on your tradition, um, sort of in the universal church, is or is not as popular, but it's incredibly necessary because it reminds us of Mary's autonomy in the process, right? While it is true that Gabriel comes and says this is going to happen, Mary nonetheless has the opportunity to say yes, let it be unto me, right? And so while there's lots of conversations there, we need to remember that, that Mary is part of the process. Um, and these ideas are important for that, right? First disciple, chief of saints, basically be sort of this interchanging of disciples, apostles, saints in the early church, um, sort of as being all the same thing. And now there's two potentially problematic, that should say, potentially problematic, Marian doctrines that I think, again, Lutherans, A, either misunderstand or um, don't like. But we need to know about them if we're going to talk about Mary. And these are very old. Both are apocryphal, meaning that they don't necessarily have scriptural basis but are held in the tradition of the church from the earliest councils and by that have some authority. I mean, I said last week talking about the Trinity, that the idea of the Trinity as we know it today doesn't really show up in scripture either, but we had to work it out together. And by working out together and holding it in common, there is something to it. The first is the idea of the Immaculate Conception. While this is the belief that in anticipation of her role as Theotokos, Mary was conceived without sin. It's been around for a long time. It was codified by Pope Pius IX in 1865, the last time 
that the idea of the Pope speaking uh, infallibly ex cathedra um, was used. So the last, so so the so the next time anybody argues with you about the Pope being infallible, no one's used it since 1865 with the codification of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, which is again, uh, and I realize it's a sort of convoluted sentence there. What the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception says is God knew that Mary would be Jesus's mom. And in order to prepare for that, knowing that was going to happen, when St. Anne, that's the mother of Mary, conceived Mary, she did so without the sin of original sin, which basically means that St. Joachim, that's Mary's dad, all of this is apocryphal, by the way, but St. Joachim and St. Anne did not together conceive Mary because she was conceived without original sin. Basically, the, and what this does is this helps to wrestle with the idea of how can a sinful woman carry God in her womb? And as the, as the sort of belief in the, in the Theotokos says, and that Jesus's humanity, the human side of Jesus comes from Mary, well, then Jesus has to have sin because it's part Mary. And what this is saying is, no, that doesn't have to be because G God knew it was going to happen. And so Mary was without sin. And there's all sorts of apocryphal stories of Mary who worked her little childhood fingers, sewing the curtain of the temple, the same one that will be torn in two when Jesus is, is crucified. There's all sorts of apocryphal stories about, about sort of virgin, you know, little baby Virgin Mary. Doesn't matter. The idea is this is this helped people to wrap their heads around how is it possible that Mary could be the God bearer. Luther himself several times mentions the sinlessness of Mary. Luther was a, did subscribe to the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. More so earlier in his writings. But later in his writings, he doesn't refute it. He just kind of goes real silent on Mary for a while. As I said, there's no scriptural basis to this, but there is a theological usefulness to this, which is to help people to wrap their minds around how Mary could possibly bear God in the world if she herself had this uh, sort of original sin. That's particularly important when we consider that the early church held that even in baptism, there were vestiges of original sin uh, in a person and that Mary being born before Jesus could not have it erased because baptism wasn't a thing. So the theological usefulness of this sort of trumps that there's no scriptural basis. The second potentially problematic Marian doctrine, particularly for those of us that grew up Lutheran, is the idea of the assumption. This is also known, especially in the Eastern church as the Dormition of the Theotokos, the Dormition of the, uh, of the Virgin. Dormition basically meaning the falling asleep of, right? So this is the falling asleep of the Virgin, uh, what the Western church has come to know as the assumption. We need to clarify some things. In the same way that we need to clarify some stuff about the Immaculate Conception, we have to clarify some stuff about the assumption. There is no denial that Mary was mortal. Mary dies. She outlives her son. He dies, is risen, ascends into heaven, body and soul, fully alive. Doesn't happen to Mary. Mary dies. But after her death, Mary's body is assumed into heaven. Basically meaning that, and there's various stories about this. One of the more famous ones is that St. Thomas was running late because he always runs late to everything and comes and is overcome with his grief and asks that her sarcophagus be opened. Everybody was buried in a sar sarcophagus in the ancient world. Um, that her sarcophagus be opened, that he might give her one last farewell. And when they open the sarcophagus, her body is no longer there is sort of one of the more popular ones. But basically the idea is Mary dies and then her body disappears. Again, there is no scriptural basis for this. We have no writings that tell of Mary's death, 
but this serves a pragmatic usefulness, which is to say, if there was anywhere on earth that claimed to have any of the parts of Mary's body, and we know there would be plenty of them, those places would just be completely overrun. So instead what this says is there is no place on earth that holds the physical remains of the mother of God. Is it true? Is it not true? I think that's for faith to tell us. Um, in the same way that the Immaculate Conception is for faith to tell us. But part of the reason, uh, but part of why we still have these, even if they're not uh, scripturally based and you know, how do they come about if they're not in scripture, they serve a purpose, uh, they are helpful. And again, when a whole group of people get together and say, but we've worked together, we've used our minds and our God-given gifts to discuss and talk about this, there's something holy to that, uh, whether or not it sort of has these scriptural bases. So these are the two potentially problematic Marian doctrines, at least for most Lutherans I talk to. These are kind of the two where people sometimes draw their lines in the sand. If you've ever met me and we've ever talked about Mary, you'll know I don't have any real clear lines in the sand for Mary, but uh, this is, th these are the two potentially problematic ones. And the last thing to talk about is what do we do with Mary now? So that's a lot of history, but you know, Jesus, the Trinity, we know what we do with them. We celebrate them every Sunday. We celebrate them every time we get together. We celebrate them whenever we make the sign of the cross. Mary's a little different. We don't celebrate her nearly as often. We celebrate her, um, on these, what are known as the Marian feast days. So for us in the Lutheran church, we've come to know January 1st as the holy name of Jesus. In the Eastern church, it's the feast of the circumcision. It's technically and has, was originally the maternity of the mother of God. It is the celebration of Mary being a mom. All these things celebrate the same idea that January 1st is the eighth day after Christmas, which means Jesus was eight years old and therefore it was time for him to get a name and be circumcised and marry herself to be purified and ready to go back into public life, celebrated as a mother. All these things together, but in its Marian form, uh, we have the maternity of the mother of God. The 2nd of February is the purification of Mary or the presentation of our Lord as we know it in the Lutheran church. Um, again, we kind of fudge the liturgical time uh, because we know that that happened much closer to the eighth day, but we have it on the 2nd of February. March 25th is the Annunciation. If you do the math, that's nine months until Christmas when we celebrate the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and saying, hey, Mary, you're gonna be a mom. It's nine day, it's nine months from Christmas. And while the story goes that this happened first, we got the date for the feast working backwards from Christmas. Uh, if you remember, uh, there are several times where uh, the Annunciation falls during Holy Week, uh, which kind of, I think, always just has a really fabulous constellation of celebrations of sort of beginning and ending uh, in the same celebration. Then on the 31st of May, we have the Feast of the Visitation, or as our new book calls it, the Visit of Mary to Elizabeth, because we didn't want to get too confused. But it's the Feast of the Visitation. This is when Mary, it's about three months after the Annunciation. And in her third month, Elizabeth's sixth month, Mary goes and visits Elizabeth. So we're gonna commemorate this. And this, this is the feast day of the Magnificat. This is the story where Mary goes, oh, that's what's gonna happen. And sings the Magnificat on this day. August 15th is the feast of the Assumption or the Domitian, or for those of us in the ELCA, this is the day that we celebrate Mary, mother of our Lord. Again, because some Lutherans get real uncomfortable talking about the mother of God, but generally speaking, when we celebrate Mary on the 15th of August, we are celebrating the Assumption. That's how we got that random day in the middle of August. Uh, and then finally, two not necessarily Lutheran observances, but that flesh out the rest of Mary's life is September 8th is the Nativity of the Virgin, that's Mary's birthday. And then the 8th of December, which is nine months before September, uh, is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, uh, when Mary is conceived without sin, and the Patronal Feast Day of the United States, 
uh, the United States patron saint is Mary of the Immaculate Conception. The interesting thing when we talk about the Marian feasts for Lutherans is that we keep almost all of these. We could celebrate the Nativity of Mary in the Immaculate Conception. There's nothing really wrong with doing so. They just have sort of fallen off our calendars. But we keep all these, but always focused on Jesus. Always this idea that it's not about the maternity of Mary, but about the holy name of Jesus. It's not about Mary's purification. It's about the presentation of our Lord. The Annunciation and the Visitation, there's no real problems there. And then when it comes to the Assumption, it's about this focus on Mary as mother of our Lord. Um, right, because this is the last time we're going to get that notification before she uh, is assumed into heaven. So for those of us who are Lutherans, and we have to deal with Mary, Luther never gets rid of veneration for Mary. Arguably, Luther kind of likes Mary. He talks about her relatively often, actually. It's a much later development in the Lutheran Church as a sort of very anti-Catholic sentiment that any veneration for Mary is too Catholic. Um, if you remember though, back to the Lutheran Book of Worship, we had several Mary hymns in there, including one of my favorite, the Stabat Mater or At the Cross, Her Station Keeping. Um, we had several more uh, Mary hymns that kind of got taken out for the new book. Um, but Luther never gets rid of veneration for Mary. He uses titles like Queen of Heaven when he talks about her and also never uh, 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 and also he mentioned several times her uh, perpetual virginity and her sinlessness, sort of all these ideas that we've had so far. What he pushes back on is this idea of Mary as redemptrix or co-redemptrix, um, which is this idea that Mary's kind of the back door to Jesus. So the idea of Mary as redemptrix or co-redemptrix is that in venerating Mary, a believer could share some portion of redemption or salvation, never as fully uh, as, uh, as this connection to Jesus, but that in connecting with Mary, his mother, you kind of shaved a little bit off purgatory, right? You're a little less likely to go to hell because Mary is seen as the back door to Jesus, right? with the idea that everybody listens to their mama, right? So if you asked Mary to pray for you and Mary prayed to Jesus and said, hey, this person really likes, you know, has been really nice to me, so you should be nice to him, then Jesus would do so, right? And so it's Mary is sort of this backdoor to Jesus. You see this often in art, particularly in the Renaissance, and you still see it a little bit in art, uh, particularly what you will see is in the last judgment, Mary is seated next to Jesus very closely, um, a little bit down, but, but sort of next to Jesus. And often right next to her, right behind her, there's a ladder or a very long rosary that can be used as a rope ladder. And this idea that veneration of Mary sort of is this other way up uh, to heaven. That's what Luther pushes back on. Luther pushes back on the fact that Mary in any way has anything to do with our salvation rather than to be venerated as all the saints are, as these examples of faithful living. And particularly for Mary, even more than that, because she is the one that bears God into the world. And that that for Luther is worthy of honor and respect. And to follow the sort of mandate from scripture that she would be blessed throughout all generations, right? That's what uh, the witness is for Mary. And that's sort of what Luther pushes back on. So just for those of us that grew up Lutheran, honor, respect, celebrating Mary is not a non-Lutheran thing. It just kind of got lost there for a while. So pictures. So here's a manuscript illustration of Mary as the new Eve. You see here that Mary on the one side, um, Plucking from, <laughs> plucking from the tree of life host, that, that is communion host, that she is feeding to people. And Eve is plucking apples uh, being given to her by the serpent. There's a lot going on in this, but what we have here is not just the idea that Mary as queen of heaven is feeding communion to the faithful and Eve is not. 
But we also have the idea, and we sing about this, uh, that the fruit of the tree of life is Jesus crucified, right? So this idea of cross as a uh, tree and Jesus as the fruit upon it, we sing that when we sing, um, uh, sing my tongue, a glorious battle, um, right? That song talks about um, true cross uh, on your sinews, something about fruit. Um, but so that's where we start to get some of these that are going on here. Theotokos, God bear. This is the most famous uh, depiction of Mary as Theotokos. She is literally bearing God inside of her. Uh, and if you notice that there are two seraphim, we know because it's one head with six wings, um, because Ma that is one of Mary's uh, attributes, right? That she is higher than this, uh, she is higher than the cherubim and more glorious than the seraphim, right? She's higher than anything kind of right next to Jesus um, as far as veneration goes. This is Queen of Heaven. Uh, this is, if you remember a couple weeks ago, I showed a picture of Christ enthroned, the Maestus Domini uh, from Santa Paranari Nuovo. This is on the opposite wall that faces it, which is a matching uh, picture of uh, Mary enthroned uh, between the angels. Yes, John. Um, are these all, uh, I got a little lost here, are these all from the Renaissance or earlier? So these are from various uh, phases. So that we had a sort of medieval manuscript there showing the early uh, sort of the new Eve. Cause that, I, the idea of Mary as the new Eve is still around in some places, but not nearly as much as it was for a while, particularly once we realized uh, how wrong it was for us to not see the equality of women in, uh, in religion, in scripture, in the entire story of Christianity. And that's sort of the problem with using the, the, the Eve narrative. And then we had just a generic icon. Frankly, I got it off of a. Oh, okay. I, I, I got it off a website store actually, uh, where you could buy it yourself if you wanted. Um, and now we're looking at a picture of mosaics from Santa Ponar Nuovo, which we saw a few weeks ago. Okay. Where we saw where we saw Christ enthroned between the angels, and here on the wall facing it is Mary enthroned with the Christ child on her lap between the angels. Okay. So so this is a little bit so so this is again mosaic from one of those Ravenna churches we saw last week. Hi, Jake. Now, this is from one of my favorite artists. This is from Fra Angelico, who was uh, very, on the very earliest cusp of the Renaissance in the 1300s. Uh, this is a, one of his most famous pieces uh, of the Annunciation. This is Gabriel showing up with these multicolored wings to talk to Mary over here as she says, yes. This idea of the Annunciation, this idea of uh, Gabriel visiting and telling Mary what's going on and Mary saying yes. This is sort of this idea of Mary as first disciple. This is a fresco actually. This is painted on a wall in the monastery of San Marco in Florence where Fra Angelico was one of the brothers. Um, it's beautiful. It's in the oddest place because it's kind of on the wall as you go up the stairs, um, but it's gorgeous and it's huge and it's much bigger than you would think it was. Uh, beautiful in person, uh, I think still beautiful here, uh, but Frangelico from about the 1300s. Chief of Saints, this one's blurry, but this is another uh, sort of 1400s, uh, sort of early Renaissance, we know because there's not a lot of perspective in it, but what, what and it's blurry, I know, uh, but the whole point here is Chief of Saints, so here's all the saints, right? You have. Uh, monks and bishops and virgins and doctors of the church. And here's some of the disciples. Here's Paul with his sword and Peter with his keys. And uh, this is John with his book. And Mary's in front of all of them. Mary generally always looks the same. She's sort of shrouded all over in this sort of head scarf, robe wrap, cape thing she always seems to wear. Um, but she's first in line. 
this is part of an altar piece so that in the middle there would be a crucifixion and there'd be more saints on the other side. Uh, but first in line, chief of saints, there's Mary. Um, and again, this is sort of unknown, but 1400s-esque. This is the idea of the Immaculate Conception. You may not realize it, Jesus is not in the picture. So this looks like a Madonna and child. This looks like an icon of Mary holding Jesus. But instead, this is Saint Anne, the mother of Mary. This is Mary seated in her arms, looking very much like full grown adult Mary, because that's generally how she's depicted. We know because she has the shroud, uh, but she also has these stars on her robe, which again, harken back to Revelation 12 um, and the woman crowned with stars. Uh, so we know this is the Theotokos, but she looks like an adult hanging out in St. Anne who's wearing a fabulous shade of orange. Um, but again, th this icon of the Immaculate Conception, this idea that Mary is conceived without sin that's part of why she's depicted as a full grown adult. It's this idea of knowing what was coming, knowing she was gonna be Jesus's mom was why she was conceived without sin. And so it's sort of this, in the way only icons can do, it sort of bridges time and space at the same time. Here's the Dormition. This is a mosaic from the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. Uh, that is the Church of St. Mary Major or St. Mary of the Snows in Rome. Uh, this is the Dormition. So you see, there is no denial that Mary dies. Here she is on her uh, funeral bier. Um, she will be wrapped in this linen and put down into uh, a sarcophagus because again, everybody's buried in a, in a sarcophagus. And yet, she is already here wrapped in the white. So, so we see Mary going to be wrapped in this white robe by all of the apostles who have showed up. She's gonna be wrapped in the white robe, but here she is already in the arms of Jesus in her white robe. This is Jesus in heaven, we know, cause there's a rainbow. So Jesus is already seated in, in heaven where he has received the Virgin already. This is how we know, sort of are able to read this story. Here's Peter, we know, because he has a beard and a full set of hair, swinging his incense, because there should always be incense in church. Here's Paul, we know, because he's bald and has a big head, right? That's how we know Paul's here. Um, but again, we have this whole idea of uh, Mary sort of will be sort of assumed into heaven. Uh, this again is mosaic from the Church of St. Mary Major uh, in Rome. Now we get into some more Renaissance things. This is Van der Weiner. Van der Weiner? Van der Reiner. He does a he has a beautiful um, crucifixion scene at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, but this is uh, in celebration of Mary as mother of God. Why do I say that? I say that because uh, this here is St. Luke. St. Luke is writing the story of Mary as she nurses Jesus. But if you notice real close, and unfortunately I can't exactly zoom in there, um, but if you notice real close, in writing Mary's story, he's actually drawing an icon. This is a very famous depiction of St. Luke. St. Luke is often shown at an easel or holding a, a piece of paper where he is drawing the portrait of the Virgin. Why? Well, Luke says more about Mary and Jesus' whole family than anybody else. He spends three whole chapters dealing just with Jesus' childhood and genealogy and family background. It's more than anybody else. And so there's this sort of connection uh, to Mary. And so here is St. Luke writing the story of, by drawing an icon of, uh, Mary as she nurses Jesus. So this is full on celebration of the maternity of the mother of God. Purification of the Virgin. 
as, as we've said, this is the feast of the presentation of our Lord or purification of the Virgin. This uh, is another uh, fresco by Frangelico. I think this is the last one, but if you ever wanted to know, seriously, one of my favorite artists. So this is another fresco where we see Mary who has kind of shockingly given up Jesus to, to be in Simeon's arms. Uh, and Joseph is kind of following behind her carrying the basket full of turtle doves for a sacrifice. Um, this is Simeon. Simeon holds Jesus who's wrapped up like a cigar. Um, and this is key. This is how we read things like this. So if we hearken back to the story of the presentation, Simeon takes uh, takes Jesus in his arms and says, oh, this is the one destined for uh, the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And you, Mary, a sword will pierce your soul too. How do we remember all that? Jesus is wrapped up as if he were a mummy. I said a cigar, but really, if you think about this, he's wrapped up as if he was wrapped in his burial cloths. So that even though this is infant Jesus, there are these precursors of his death, which is the reminders of Mary's sword, Jesus' death, the way through which he will be the falling and rising of many uh, in Israel. So you see how we get sort of all these ideas that we've gotten about the stories of Jesus and the stories of Mary in very subtle pieces of this art, a lot of which is just in the way that we wrapped up Jesus. Now, I'm sure there are many that would tell you that this is a great way to wrap up an infant, right? There's all the comfort of sort of swaddling an infant. But I think this is a little bit more than swaddling an infant. This looks like he's wrapped up for burial because this will be how we often show uh, uh, Lazarus wrapped uh, when he emerges from the tomb. I do like that he's wearing nice red booties. Uh, Jesus gets to wear nice red booties next to the fireplace over here. The Annunciation is the next Marian feast. And here we have the famous piece, at least for those of us that live in Philadelphia, the famous piece by Henry Osawa Tanner, uh, a uh, African-American artist who uh, is very famous around here in Philadelphia and a very famous depiction of the Annunciation in that it's really sort of the first time in real public art that Mary is depicted as something not blonde hair, blue eyed, white Mary. Uh, here we definitely have ethnicity and there's various versions of what that ethnicity is. But we also have the idea that this is Gabriel, this big glow. And again, this is a detail. So there's, it's a bigger painting, uh, but this just the glow is, um, is Gabriel. What's so great about this picture is this is so human. This is human Mary. This is young girl Mary. This is, surprised and shocked and don't know quite what to say, but I'm gonna say yes, Mary. This is Mary literally who looks like she was woken up out of bed and didn't even have a chance to make it, Mary. If we think back to Fra Angelico's Annunciation where Mary looks like she was prepared, she put on the tea kettle, she has a place to sit. She's kind of just sitting there in the courtyard waiting for Gabriel to show up, right? She's ready to go. She's all clothed and dressed and nicely layered. Everything's all covered up. She's able to cover up herself. She has a nice little, you know, blanket on her lap because it's a little chilly outside. Her hair's done, the whole deal for, for Gabriel to show up. It's a much different depiction when we see this idea of sort of Mary got up and threw on her bathrobe because there was a big light in the room and she didn't know what it was. I just think there's something to the humanity of this, and particularly this idea that Mary's not blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white Mary. Um, it's just one of my favorite pieces. And I know for a lot of people that live in Philadelphia, it's a big piece. This is a more contemporary piece. This is from the late 1900s. Uh, called uh, Joyful Leaping. Um, or, or Leap of Joy. This is called Leap of Joy, a depiction of the visitation. Again, important in that neither Mary, this is Mary, oh, no, sorry, this is Mary, neither Mary nor Elizabeth are white. 
Mary with her hand reached out to feel John the Baptist leaping in Elizabeth's womb, which is the sign to Elizabeth that Mary is to be the mother of her Lord, right? But just this, this amazing human moment here. And that's one of the great things about the story of Mary and why I think Mary is so important is Mary, while, it, while she is not this co-redemptrix, while she is not a means of salvation, she is a way for us to see ourselves in the story because she is from the beginning, fully human. She is 100% human. She really is just like us. Jesus is fully human. There's always this, you know, Jesus is sort of this untouchable figure, but it's moments like this in the humanity of Mary where you go, oh, like real people. This happened to real people. I think this is a powerful image here of the visitation. Again, the feast day being, uh, May 31st. The next uh, feast day that we have is Mary, Mother of Our Lord, the Feast of the Assumption or the Domitian of Mary. Um, and for those of us in the Lutheran Church, the gospel text for this Sunday, uh, or for, for this feast day, is the Magnificat, right? My soul cries out, um, uh, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. This is a new piece. Uh, just created uh, in 2020 by, I'm going to read it here, by Lauren Wright Pittman. Uh, this is available as a print if you want it from um, uh, uh, Sanctified Art is the name of the group. Um, I'm going to read the, the artist's statement on this because I think what's important about this is to see the ways that people are still experiencing Mary in the 21st century. So this again was created in 2020 by Lauren Wright Pittman. Um, and it's titled uh, Contours, Contours of Mary's Dream is the name of this piece. It shows Mary as a uh, African-American woman with uh, sort of rainbow braids as she holds what we would assume to be Jesus, uh, a, a baby Jesus, but all that's there is a halo and not Jesus himself. There's no body for Jesus. And here's what the artist has to say. As I read Mary's song this year, I felt a sting of grief, one that I hadn't felt in response to this text before. In the wake of George Floyd's murder, artist Titus Kafer created an image for Time Magazine devoted to Black mothers. In his image, analogous color, he depicts a black mother fiercely and lovingly holding her child. However, her child is cut out of the image, leaving a harsh blank hole with shadows where the child should be. Reflecting on that piece, Kafar wrote, in her expression, I see the black mothers who are unseen and rendered helpless in this fury against their babies. As I listlessly wade through another cycle of violence against black people, I paint a black mother eyes closed, furrowed brow, holding the contour of her loss. <laughs> Pittman, the artist of this piece on the screen in front of you says, when I read the Magnificat, Cathar's image comes into sharp relief. How could I imagine holding Mary, holding the contours of her dreams for the world while also holding the contour of her loss? Mary's son would be publicly murdered at the hands of the state and her song reverberates for all mothers who have had dreams for their children shattered by senseless violence. I had this instinct to read the Magnificat alongside the first creation narrative in Genesis. I imagine Christ taking form in Mary's womb, much like I imagine all of creation emerging at the creator's voice. I collaged macro photography of patterns, textures, and colors from creation. Sunsets, birds, feathers, fish, scales, galaxies, leaves, planets, fur, water, and wove them into her hair. Jesus, the thread of creation, is being knit together in her womb. God's dream for all creation is materializing as cells divide in her body, all the while she sings of a dream still unrealized. So, Mary's Magnificat is nine verses. It is Luke 46 to 55. Um, 
and from that we get we still get beautiful art that speaks into the 21st century i just think this is a really powerful piece i have it in my shopping cart i am waiting for the opportune moment to purchase uh, for myself but this is one of my favorites again back to feast days that we don't necessarily celebrate as lutherans uh the nativity of the virgin we could for all intents and purposes think that this was a christmas icon right we have uh, except for the fact that there's no man, except up here, um, this we could make this into an nativity icon, right? Somebody's given birth, there's a baby, it looks a lot. But this is again, St. Anne. We know because her name Anna is here. This is Joachim. This is uh, her father. Uh, these are the midwives down here. And this is Mary, again, looking kind of like an adult, just in miniature. Finally, the Immaculate Conception. This is, uh, again, one of the more famous depictions of um, Saint Anne with the Virgin, with Jesus all seated on a throne together. So you sort of have the lineage of Jesus, right? By matriarchy. This is Jesus, son of Mary, son of Anne, uh, daughter of Anne, um, sort of as this depiction here, um, sort of all with their own versions of uh, interaction with the idea of original sin. That's the end of our slideshow for this evening. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns um, on this particular um, uh, topic or the paintings that we've seen? Yes, Martha. The, the Immaculate Conception and the Dormition of Mary seem to me so contrived. Um, and I just wonder, why that is necessary when all things are possible with God. <laughs> Not yes. So I would say um, after 2000 years of debating the situation, I think we've all been able to hold on to a little bit more of the mystery. Um, and certainly for those of us here that have been talking about the Trinity and Jesus and talking about how much of that is a mystery that we just hold in faith, most of those teachings, most of the doctrines around Mary and, and others comes from this time of the early councils when really it's an idea of the apology, right? The sort of Greek idea of apology, the idea of having to defend faith. So it's this idea where as you are um, seeking converts or people are converting to your religion, questions come up. And the more you learn about Christianity, the more paradoxical it is. For those of us that have grown up Lutheran or have been Lutherans most of our lives, we'll know that paradox is where Lutherans like to live, right? Sinner and saint uh, all at the same time, right? We love both and um, we love paradox. But it's taken us, it took Luther 1500 years, arguably, to get there, right? For the church to be at a place by 1517, that Luther could have these concepts and for us another 500 years uh, of inheriting sort of what that looks like. So I think when we look at just how old those doctrines are, a lot of it is to explain at the time things that really did kind of need to be explained for people. And that's why I say that while they're not scriptural, they're useful, whether theologically in the case of the Immaculate Conception or pragmatically, in the case of um, of the Dormition, again, because the potential at the time for there to be real chaos around, say, the burial place of Mary, um, you know, poses poses some some real issues. In the same way that trying to figure out how all of God could be in a sinful woman is easily fixed when you say, right, but God foresaw these things. I won't disagree with you that largely because we have no scriptural basis for them, they came that way by debate, but arguably so did a lot of our understanding of the Trinity even come from people saying, well, we were taught this and we were taught this. Okay, well, somewhere in the middle there is truth. I think it's a little different when we get to Mary because we're not dealing with a sort of concept as much as a person and trying to figure out the rest of her story. So I won't disagree with you that it's, 
not scripturally based. Um, but again, I think that there's something to tradition in the church uh, where enough people for enough years have held to something together, that there's something in that holding it together, whether or not you know, the facts and details are there. I do think though, that there's a reason why Lutherans just don't really deal with the Immaculate Conception or the Dormition. And Luther largely just stops talking about them himself. Um, he's, he's pretty pro them early on in his writings. Um, and then just sort of lets it go. He, it's not one that he fights. He fights a lot of battles, but he never fights uh, the Immaculate Conception. He never fights the Assumption of Mary. And he arguably never fights praying the rosary. Uh, Luther's not against praying the rosary so long as it helps and doesn't hinder your faith, right? So if you think that praying the rosary is something you have to do to earn your salvation, stop. If it helps you to sort of focus your thoughts and if you do it in sort of this way of honoring the mother of God, by all means, pick up a rosary, right? And he says that often. And so that's, you know, we just kind of have to sort of sit with that a little bit. But but I don't disagree with you on, on it can feel very made up. Um, I think it's helpful to give Mary a beginning and end to her story that she doesn't otherwise get. But what happens after that, I think, is a whole other piece to it. Was there more, Martha, or uh, Larry? No, thank, thank you. <laughs> I think Larry has. Yes. Yes, Larry. Oh, I love the artwork of St. Anne and Mary and Jesus in the descending ladder of purification. Um, but I have to confess, I'm ashamed of being a Lutheran most of my life. I don't know anything about St. Anne. Where does she come in? I know about uh, Elizabeth was uh, Mary's sister who had her uh, hands on her belly. That was um, great. Uh, Elizabeth was her kinswoman, uh, oh. more like a cousin. Oh. Uh, Elizabeth was more like Mary's older cousin, twice mm. removed. Um, mm. But uh, mm. St. Anne and St. Joachim are the parents of Mary, right? So Anne is Mary's mom, uh, Jesus' grandmother. Joachim is Mary's father and Jesus' grandfather. They are of, um, by tradition, they are nowhere in the Bible. You didn't miss anything in Sunday school. They are <laughs> entirely uh, apocryphal, right? They come from outside of scripture mm. that we have today. They come from outside of biblical scripture, right? They're not in the 66 books of the Protestant Bible. They're not even in the extra canonical books of the Apocrypha that you might find in some of your Bibles. These come from ancient apocryphal books such as the gospel of mary or the birth uh the infancy narratives of so and so right so it comes from a tradition and the scripture of the earliest church that kind of got lost in the process but i but yeah so you didn't miss anything but Anne and joachim were the parents of mary they worked in the temple they, they were temple workers um, which is why Mary very early on is dedicated to work in the temple, so the story goes, where she, with her little virgin hands, with all the other virgins in town, sort of take up to sew and weave the great uh, cascading curtain of the temple that, in the same version of the story, is the same one that's still hanging when Jesus is crucified and it's torn in two, which is why that's such a important piece of the story for Matthew. Totally made up. Uh, Mary obviously did have a mother and father. She came from somewhere. She didn't just sort of sprout up from under a rock. She came from somewhere. We gave them a name. The thing is, when it comes to things like that, I don't mind so much because I've done the same thing in my sermons, right? I've given Mrs. Zebedee a name before because <laughs> she's just called Zebedee and the wife of Zebedee and I think that's rude I think Mrs. Zebedee should have a name um and so what happened is in the early church either from this tradition or elsewhere we get to a place where Mary has to have parents and because Mary's the important one right Joseph I mean Joseph barely ever shows up right Joseph does not 
speak anything in the New Testament. He shows up for a couple of chapters at the beginning and then kind of leaves the picture. We don't ever care about his story. That's a whole other fascinating story for another time. Um, but because Mary is so important, because we need to have this lineage, because we need to establish who Mary is, then the church gives Anne and Joachim as the names of her parents. You didn't miss anything, but that's St. Anne. St. Anne is the oh. mother of Mary and in her own right, patron saint of motherhood because okay. she was the grandmother of Jesus. All right, thank you. Are there other questions, comments, concerns uh, as we sort of wrap our time up here together? Seeing none, thank you always for joining with me. I'll be honest, I don't know what next week's topic is, um, but I think we're moving on to some more uh, interesting and not quite so historic uh, theology as we do that. Uh, but it is always great to be together with you and a reminder that Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. there'll be a pre-recorded service. Wednesday evening there will be Eucharist. Um, and if I don't see you at those, then I'll see you Sunday. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks Good so stuff. Much. Good stuff tonight.